Good morning, First Baptist Church. Would you stand this morning? Let's worship God together as we sing.
was doubt and fear. There is only one foundation. We believe. We believe. In this broken generation. Because I know that you love me And you're the 
Well, we want to take just a moment and work, uh, welcome you all this morning uh, to First Baptist Church, especially if you're a first-time guest. A special word of welcome to you. We're just glad that you're here and have chosen to spend this morning uh, worshiping with us uh, together. If you are a first-time guest, I'd like to draw your attention to these Connect cards that you'll find right in front of you in your uh, pew pockets. If you'd take just a minute, fill one of these out. Uh, when the offering plate comes by in just a moment, uh, drop that in. What that does is allows one of our pastors to get in touch with you, uh, let you know a little bit about the church, um, and let you know some of the ministries that are going on, and just thank you for being a part of, of the service today. So if you'd take a minute to do that. Um, also, I'd like to draw our attention to missionary cards that are located in the lobby today. Um, First Baptist Church supports a number of global mis missionaries, and there have been time and time again where these missionaries have expressed to us their thankfulness for receiving cards for, uh, on birthdays or anniversaries, just kind of a reminder to them that we are praying for them, that we know that they're out there doing God's work, uh, and it's just an encouragement. So at the end of the service, if you take just a minute of your time uh, to write your name, maybe a little message, letting them know that you're thinking about them, that you're praying for them, that would be uh, really appreciated by them, I'm sure. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite Lauren up to the stage. She's going to pray for our offering. Good morning. And let us pray. Dear God, we come before you this morning so grateful for this opportunity to praise you and glorify you for the blessings that you give us each and every day. Sometimes it's so easy to forget how much we have to be thankful for. But when we come together in worship, you continue to open our eyes and our hearts to the beauty of your glorious plans for us. As we remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy every day, we think of how they followed in the footsteps of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for those who work to protect and achieve peace throughout the world in every nation. Please hold all servicemen and women and their families and loved ones in your arms, 
Protect them with your shelter and grace in your presence as they stand up for us. We also remember the families of all troops. We ask for your blessings to fill their homes, and we pray for your peace and strength and that it will fill their lives. May the members of all armed forces be supplied the courage to face every day, and may they trust in the Lord's mighty power and love. Please use us, our gifts, our resources, and our lives to further your name and your kingdom. Would you show kindness and mercy to people who are hungry and homeless? Bless the families in our church and our community. Watch over students and people of all ages and guide those whom we partner together with in the mission of spreading the amazing news of Christ's love and grace throughout the earth. May your presence fill this place and speak to each one of us today and use us to bring your kingdom here, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I just want to take this opportunity um, before the scripture reading this morning to acknowledge and introduce our um, guest speaker today. Uh, Jim Couch is going to be sharing the word with us. Jim and his wife Lois have been longtime friends of First Baptist and mission partners here. Um, they work with an organization called InterServe and have been working with InterServe for about 25 years. Uh, serving as missionaries in Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Thailand, and now they serve as uh, missionary trainers in New Zealand. Um, so Jim and Lois, we're glad to have you here. Thanks for being here. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more uh, in depth about the work that they do through InterServe, there's actually going to be a gathering here this evening just in the back room here at 7 o'clock. Everyone is invited to come and find out about the work uh, in the mission field that uh, it's happening through InterServe and just ways that you can be involved, be praying, and there'll be just a time of Q&A and fellowship as well. So everyone is invited to come out tonight at 7 o'clock to hear more about the work that Jim and Lois are doing. So we're glad to have you here. Thank you. And our scripture reading this morning is going to come from Acts chapter 2, 
and it's going to be verses 1 through 12, which can be found on page 1078 in the Blue Pew Bibles. So again, that's going to be Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 on page 1078. The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing God Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one had heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own na native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamph Pamphylia, <laughs> Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Good morning. I hope to um, partially today answer that question that those people were having. What does this mean? Uh, we're going to be looking at that idea starting in Acts with the founding of the church. And um, I just am so thankful for this congregation. We're, we're, uh, uh, this is kind of like a highlight of our home assignments to come to Amherst. And uh, I really enjoy the community here. I grew up as a, as a son of a college professor, university professor. First, I was born at, when dad was at Penn State, and then he moved down to Virginia Tech and uh, spent a lot of my time in Blacksburg. It's kind of a, a, where I consider my home. So being in college towns is really comfortable for me. It fits really well. And uh, I noticed my daughter has now moved to a, a college town in England. So it's just kind of nice to... To, to be in this community. I love the diversity. I love the people questioning and thinking. Lois and I have often said that if we didn't uh, live in New Zealand, if we came back to the States, we would probably want to settle in Amherst and be in this church. What do you think of that? Good idea? So if the New Zealand thing doesn't work out, you'll see us showing up. Okay, now you're all saying, missionary to New Zealand. So how did you get that one? Okay, well, actually, we're some of the first missionaries to New Zealand that InnoServe has ever had. And it's a, because of the changing face of mission that we have these uh, out-of-the-box situations. So we were sent overseas to work in Afghanistan, and we uh, were overseas for 20-plus for, uh, years, 22, 23 years over there. And then we're now in a phase of our ministry where we're training the next generation of mission workers to work cross-culturally. We work in a little college called East-West College of Intercultural Studies. It's a big name for a little place. And uh, we have about 30, 30 to 5 uh, students that will come from all over the world, about a quarter from New Zealand, about a quarter from Korea, and about a quarter from other parts of the world. We'd love some of you to come. And I just put in a plug, $10,000 US a year, room and board, tuition, learn the Bible, learn how to live cross-culturally, get out of your American silo and live in another part of the world where people do things differently, 
be uncomfortable for a little while, find out what it's like for all of the migrants around you, what they feel like when they come to Amherst. Why don't you do that for a couple of years and bungee jump while you're at it, okay? Well, when we look at this passage from Acts, um, I'm, I'm encouraged because I see this kind of thing happening where people have come from all around the known world at that time. I guess I'm sorry for the person that had to read to read all those funny places, place names. It's not ones that you use all the time. But it, it's interesting if you just found an old map and looked at all the places, it, it, it would go right across the known world at that time. And these were all of the places that the Jews who had been dispersed, this diaspora community, had gone to right around the known world at that time. And while they were there, God was working through them, and people were coming into a faith in the belief of one God as revealed through the Old Testament, the Bible. They were God-fearers who may not have converted fully to Judaism. They were also proselytes who had come into the faith and had gone through the formal recognition that they were now fully Jews. And they had come at this time for this celebration of Pentecost in Jerusalem. Now, why was it that Jesus told his disciples when he left, you need to stay in Jerusalem until the Spirit comes? Okay, it's a little bit like um, watching a soccer game. You need to stay at the stadium and be excited until the goal happens. And you never know when the goal is going to happen, right? When is the goal, when is the Spirit going to come? But God knew that it was going to happen on Pentecost. And why Pentecost? Why didn't the Spirit come a few weeks earlier or a few weeks later? Because at that time, there was this diverse community of people from all over the world who were right there in Jerusalem. Through that diaspora community, God was going to be able to bring the message of salvation in Jesus Christ that they could then take back to their nations. I'm pretty excited about that. I think that's really good strategy on the part of the Holy Spirit. And we can make a strategic plan all we want to in our missions committees. But quite frankly, the Holy Spirit has got an amazing plan for us. And part of it has been for your church, your community here, to be a welcoming community to the international people that have come to study here at UMass and other colleges. Don't want to embarrass anybody, but I think it's going to be a group, big group. If you were not born in the United States, would you mind just standing right now? If you weren't born in the United States, stand up. Now, sometimes it's thank you very much. You can have a seat. It's, sometimes it's really nice to see that, isn't it? To see that we are a diverse community here in Amherst. And that we are continuing what we saw in that first church at Pentecost. We're seeing that diversity of people among us. And that, in fact, helps us to recognize what God's at work about, what he's trying to do. I always enjoyed reading the first group on the list is the Parthians. The Parthians are the ancient Persian people come from the Parthians. Um, you may know this, that uh, Persians, people, Farsi speakers, they have a hard time with their F's and P's. There was this Afghan we knew, and he, he, uh, he was a gardener, and he would say, um, the potatoes would grow up a lot better if they had fertilizer on them. And the F and P kind of get switched. So Farsi, Parsi, they get switched around. So you can see where Persians and the Farsi, the Parsi comes from. But I'm also interested at the bottom of the list, did you notice? Arab. Do you realize? You ever thought of that? At Pentecost, 
one of the languages being spoken by God through the gift of tongues was Arabic. Sit with that for a second. What does God care about the Arab peoples? Cares enough to send the Holy Spirit to preach to them on the day of Pentecost in Arabic. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. And so here we see in that diversity, this opportunity. And I got to tell you, it came to a group of people in the early church who weren't always known for being the most welcoming outside of their own community. The Jewish people haven't always been known for that. Um, There was an ancient prayer of the rabbis that, um, God, I thank you that you didn't make me uh, a Gentile or a woman. (laughs) So it was a really, uh, I'm sorry, that was kind of the, the way that they saw the world. They were so thankful that they were part of God's community and happened to not be a woman. They saw those as two things to be ostracized. Isn't that terrible to have that kind of idea? And and if you think about it, think about this experience that happens when when Jesus and his disciples are traveling to Jerusalem. Um, As they're going up to Jerusalem, they come through a Samaritan village and Luke gives this example. He's the only writer that gives this example In Luke 9, uh, 51 through 56, he says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. And they went on to another village. Very interesting little story of something that was happening in that group that shows to us this animosity that Jews had towards the Samaritans. They would often avoid Samaria altogether to get to Jerusalem from Galilee. You'd go way out into all of the Roman world and the, the Greek, the, the ten cities of, across the Jordan and come down to come in to avoid going through Samaria. Why? Well, the Samaritans had uh, taken the traditional faith and belief and they twisted it and they turned it And they made it to fit and they brought in other stuff that was localized. And they became a polluting influence for the puritanical Jews who in Babylon had learned how to truly understand the word of God and to keep things going. And they had got this Talmud organized and they came back and they were separating themselves from those groups. A little bit like us, Christians and the Muslims who have denied the the person and work of Christ and claim that he's only a prophet. And so we also, I would say, have a little bit of a problem with Muslims. Can I say that? I don't know if any of you agree. No, Jim, I'm, you know, you're up in the north now. You're not down in, down in, in the south. We're progressive up here. We're fine with them as long as they're someplace else. No, we have a historic problem, the Church of Jesus Christ with the Muslim world. It's historic. It's been wars. We've had wars against them. We've been, there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of baggage in our relationships. I'm going to tell you something that's going to freak you out. I bet you you've never had a missionary stand here, particularly who's worked in the Muslim world, do you know that my two daughters have fallen in love? One is married and one is marrying a guy who's come out of the Muslim world and they haven't come to Christ yet. 
From the day those girls were born, their father and mother has prayed diligently for them to marry the person of God's choice. What happened, Jim? Didn't you pray hard enough? Didn't you love your daughters enough? They've married these Muslim guys. And I've got to tell you, I believe both of these men are God's choice. And I think it's remarkable the journey that they are on towards knowing more about Jesus and that's part of our journey to help them in that process. Now, for some of us, that confession I just made would be a failing. I have people, who good Christian people, who say to me, your daughter's marrying a Palestinian Lebanese Arab who isn't a Christian yet? How do you feel about that? Aren't you sad? No. I'm delighted. I believe he is God's person for her. That's going to rock your world, isn't it? It's going to rock your world. You say, Jim, I just can't handle it. My mind's blown up. But that is our God. And what God wants more than anything that happens with my daughter and my son-in-laws is that I know how to be Christ to them. So what I'm talking about today isn't some academic thing. Okay, or it's not something that I'm saying because, you know, I'm just one of those other liberals that are out there thinking that we should love on the Muslims. The fact of the matter is that I believe we're in a season unlike any time in the history of the church. Do you know that more Muslims have come to Christ in the last 10 years globally than in the last 1,200 years. Do you know that God is moving among Muslim peoples around the world? And will you join in prayer with us that that movement will happen with my son-in-laws as we see them move closer and closer to following Jesus? We see a lot of signs in that direction. But it doesn't matter. Let me just tell you, folks, it doesn't matter. I don't love them in Christ because I expect to seal a deal. I love them in Christ because that is Christ in me. See, it's not about a transaction. It is that relationship. And sometimes we get transactional in our mission. I'm going to engage with you. I'm going to love you if you come to church and do this, tick all these boxes for me. That's not the way of Christ. That's not how Christ served. He served many people. He healed many people who turned away and forgot him. Remember the rich young ruler. We don't know his name. We could have known his name. He could have been an apostle. But for the fact that he turned and walked away and it made the Lord Jesus very sad. But it wasn't a transactional thing with Jesus. He loved and shared and cared because that's how our God loves. That's how our God loves and John needed to learn this. James and John, they were, they were a little bit of a... Now, my brother's name is John. I'm James. I don't know if my parents named us like that. We did fight a lot. We're both now in our 60s, and we really like each other. So just wait on, hold on until your 60s, and you have a good relationship. But John had a transformation in his life, I believe. We can see the work moving in him. And in 1 John, when he's writing this letter to this young church who he loves to try to keep them away from apostasy and, and error, he says this, 1 John 2.10, he says, whoever loves his brother abides in the light 
and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. That's really amazing coming from a guy who, who wanted to call fire down from heaven to consume a group of Samaritans. He suddenly has come to a point in his life where he realizes that we as God's people should be known by our love and not by our hate. And we get this phrase even now. I don't know where it came from. Haters got to hate. And we see this kind of just terrible stuff going on in in social media and people, Christian people feeling like it's okay to, to call fire rain down on the Muslim world. I think that breaks the heart of God. It breaks my heart to see that kind of stuff. Not maybe stepping on some toes here, but I really believe that we cannot reach people if we don't love them. We actually stumble in darkness because we're in that darkness of hate. John Stott's commentary on this phrase. Let me just read this to you. John Stott's commentary on 1 John 2, 10 and 11. Hatred distorts our perspective. We do not first misjudge people and then hate them as a result. Our view of them is already jaundiced by our hatred. It is love which sees straight, thinks clearly, makes us balanced in our outlook, judgments, and conduct. You want to know how to behave well? Behave out of love. When you see a Muslim woman wearing the hijab, wearing a head covering, what does your heart tell you? <clears throat> Why is he doing that? Doesn't she know she's free? She's an American now. She doesn't have to wear that thing. Isn't that interesting? I, I have people all the time asking me the thing about them. They worried so much about this veil. Just a little bit of veil. Brothers and sisters, if we could get in a time machine and just turn this church back about 100 years, every woman in this room would be wearing a head covering. We forget our own history. We forget our own worldviews that we have contained, we've held. And we're not patient with others to work it out. Do you know when a woman is wearing a veil, she is saying, I believe in God. And you want to rip that from her? You have imposed your impression that her Family is forcing her to do this and her husband, her father is oppressing her and you have this narrative that you've been given to place on her. Friends, you need to listen to her. You need to talk to her. You need to ask her, why do you wear the veil? And she says, because I believe in God. I want to affirm that, that there is a God. And let's find a way that you can find out who he really truly is in Christ. So that, I say, is what shakes us in this generation. That's where we are in this generation. And while you see this ethnic diversity, in this room, I'm not seeing any hijabs. Right? The fact of the matter is, is that God is moving among the Muslim people only because he can now move among his own believers to reach out and share with those that are among them. That they've moved out of the darkness like John did into walking in the light of love and make that connection. The Afghans have a wonderful proverb that says, del badal rodor. It means between people there is a way. Between hearts there is a path. And I believe I know what that path is. I believe I know that that path goes through our eyes. When we look at a person and show respect and dignity to them through our eyes, when we look into their eyes, 
with the eyes of respect and love, I believe that creates a pathway. But if you see a Muslim man wearing his cap and you go near him, do you avert your eyes? When you see a woman in the shops with a hijab on, do you avert your eyes? Or can you look upon them in respect and love? And that's what I'm asking you to think about today. I'm asking you to think about that today because I think maybe there might be a few hijabs in heaven. There should be. Because when John is looking at Revelation 5, 9, he sees this amazing choir singing this new song and it's, they're singing this song. This is, this is the lyric. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now, You've got the flags up here, and I think that's really admirable. I like that. Do you think when we get to heaven, there are going to be flags around, and my wife's a New Zealander, okay, she's got to go, all right, go over to that flag over there. That's the Kiwis are over there. The Americans are over here, and maybe, maybe the Northern or the Yankees are here, and the Southerners are over here. So we'll, we'll do you think that's what's going to happen? No, there are no flags in heaven. But we know that there are all peoples in heaven, unified and mixed and mingled together, living in that bond of community. Because what happened at Pentecost continues right through history to our times and into our future as God's people. That's where we're going. And if you don't like it, if, you don't, if you're uncomfortable being around people who are ethnically diverse than you, you you better think about heaven as if you're ready for it because that's the way it's going to be. Friends, we don't have to solve all of the social ills of racism. We don't have to solve all, everybody else's problem. We don't have to get on the internet. We don't have to get on Facebook and pull anybody down. Because we have no control over others. There's only one person that we have any capacity to bring change about in. And that's ourselves. That's ourselves. And that's what I'm encouraging you today to ask God to open you up. To see what it is that you could learn from this message of the diversity of the body of Christ. What is it that you could learn about who are the people I'm uncomfortable around and embrace that setting? A couple of weeks, I'll be going south of the Mason-Dixon line and the people I'm most uncomfortable around are rednecks. I confess it openly to you guys. We have in New Zealand a similar sort of group of people. They're called bogans. You've learned some New Zealand vocabulary now, bogans. Don't use it of anybody directly to their face. Um, I have a problem with that and I was in a parking space a couple of months ago in New Zealand where I was pulling out of the parking space and I had to stop because this guy in his big pickup truck was sitting there. He said, come on out, come on out, like that, bogan. So I pulled out and as I drove past him, my car window was open and his car window was open and I was averting my eyes. He said, you're welcome, he says through the window. See, I have my own problems. Each one of us have our own baggage of people that we can relate to. You may say, Jim, I really admire how you love Muslim people. That's great. But there's people that I find difficulty and I need to die to myself and not try to change everybody in the Bible Belt in the next two weeks. I'm going to have to work on that. Laying that aside, how am I? What can I do? What is God teaching me? How can I be the channel of his love? And del bedel rodor, have a way to the hearts of each person 
I need. May God give us that grace. Really, guys, may God give us that grace to always be walking in a place where his spirit is enabling us to die to ourself and live for him. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you so much for this community, how far they've gone in, in, in welcoming and accepting people from diverse backgrounds. But you know, each one of us have those issues, those people in our lives, those situations uh, that we find uncomfortable and we have a hard time seeing that person as you see them. I would ask you, Lord God, to come by your grace into our lives and move that situation aside. And I join with my friends here as I've asked them to pray for my son-in-law, Shawnee, and my uh, soon-to-be son-in-law, Abdul. Move them by your grace. We're all agreeing in prayer right now. Move them by your grace to a full understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ, that they may come to your feet and acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. May you be working in the lives of Muslims here in this community. May you be working at the universities among Muslims. May you be working in our lives among those that we find unlovely And in those places, we know that you have hidden what Mother Teresa called your distressing disguise, that we may come into that place and see you in that other person, to love that other person, and to see our hearts as an avenue for your spirit of grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand?
Please be seated. I would like to invite Pastor Josh and his family to come forward, and I would also like to invite our deacon team to come forward. So, as you probably know, um, Pastor Josh will be taking a well-deserved sabbatical for the months of June, July, and August. And it's our time as a church family to commission Pastor Josh and his family to wish them well and to pray for them as they embark on this period of rest and restoration. Before we do our formal prayer, I'd just like to say a couple quick things about sabbatical in the life of a church. Um, sabbatical is part of our church ministry. Each of our pastors has a time when he or she and their families take some time off for rest, for prayer, for reflection, 
and for restoration. Sabbatical from our pastors are also an example for us as Christians that we should take time away from our daily task, from our service in the community, from our service to each other, and even from our service within the church for rest, for restoration, for prayer, and for renewal as we come back to serve in our various capacities. So at this time, we're going to ask one of our deacons, David, to pray for Pastor Josh, for Lily, and for Allison. Let us pray. Hello. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We have been blessed with music and your word. We thank you for the Raskings as being part of our church family. We pray for their good health and protection. And at this time, God, we lift up Pastor Josh as he prepares for his sabbatical. We pray that this will be a time of rest, time of reflection, time of spending more time with you, and God, we pray that you'll be blessed in all ways. And with your guidance, God, may their plans come to pass. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, David. God bless you, Raskin family. And church, may you go in God's peace. Thank you.